to order. Uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Representative Bauman? Present. Representative Blanton? Here. Representative Bowling? Here. Representative Bridges? Here. Representative Burke? Here. Representative Chester Burton? Representative Dossett? Representative Dotson? Representative Flannery? Present. Representative Fugate? <laughs> Representative Gentry? <laughs> Representative Grossberg? Representative Johnson? Present. Representative McCool? Here. Representative Miles? Here. Representative Smith? Representative Williams? Present. Representative Wesley? Here. Representative White? Here. And Chair Gooch? Here. We do have a quorum. Um, I would uh, like to start by saying that uh, the uh, Energy and Environment Cabinet uh, have a group here today. They are their Leadership Academy, and those are people that are future leaders uh, that uh, are going to be learning about, uh, uh, you know, the Cabinet and the type of things that they do. And so they're here to observe today, and we are so uh, glad to have them and would like to welcome them this morning. Uh, any members have anyone else they would like to uh, recognize? Okay, seeing none. Uh, first item of business is we're going to take up uh, House Bill 236, uh, Representative Scott Sharp. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and any, uh, any have any guests uh, introduce themselves, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. I'm Representative Scott Sharp from the 100th District, and to my right, I have the State Treasurer and her counsel. I'll let them introduce themselves. Good morning, uh, the State Treasurer Allison Ball, and I have my counsel, Brittany Warford, with me this morning. Good morning, General Counsel for Treasurer Ball, Brittany Warford. All right, thank you. Uh, this bill, uh, House Bill 236, basically has two elements to it. It's ESG and proxy voting. Now, yes, sir. Motion on the sub. Okay. Uh, and you members, we, we got that to you yesterday afternoon, I think. So we have a motion on the to adopt the committee sub. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All, all opposed? Okay, the committee sub is adopted. Go ahead, now proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, this bill has two elements, ESG and proxy voting. ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance investing. And a lot of these big invest in, investing companies that manage uh, large amounts of money are, are using this to invest in. And when you think about ESG, think socialism, because that's what it basically comes down to. Uh, this started out over the interim where I read an article on ESG and the investing, and it was not based on fiduciary returns for pension funds, and that was a lot, a lot of people were having issues with that. So the pension funds that the state manages and responsible for, uh, we've got to make sure they get a fiduciary return, like the teacher's pension, for example. We need to make sure we maximize the returns on that as much as possible. ESG does not base they're investing on what's going to give us a fiduciary return. They base it on these environmental, social, and government uh, uh, status of whatever company they want to invest in. Uh, that's kind of how it got started. I started looking at it, and it led me to the uh, AG's office. I started talking with the AG's office, who uh, I believe I got Mr. Maddox sitting back here with us also today. And... Uh, and that led me over to the Treasury office, so they were already working on something, and so we just all kind of got together. The second part of this is proxy voting, which also goes along with ESG, where they can't take our, the proxy votes for the people in our pension funds and use those proxy votes to vote for ESG type of uh, in investing and stuff of that nature. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Treasurer Ball. You've already heard a good summary of what ESG is, but I'll just give you a little more uh, in-depth because it's been an issue that I've been dealing with for the whole time that I've been in office, but it's been a, a heated issue for the last year and a half to two years. And you've heard ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, and that's correct. The uh, best way, I think, to understand this is once upon a time, 
pensions and investments were about returns, just making sure that when you retired, you could retire, you had funds when you retired, you're getting good returns out of your investments. And in the last few years, there's been a move afoot to really change the strategy to push certain outcomes, uh, usually social outcomes, ideological outcomes. It's been very heavy on the E side, so the environmental side, which has been targeting the fossil fuel industry. That's why Kentucky, I, I know many of you remember the bill that was passed last year that dealt with this issue. Um, so so this is a serious issue. We've been dealing with this in a nuts and bolts way for, for a few years uh, or for a year and a half. And uh, it's come to our attention that, that we think that it needs to be addressed in statute just to just to make sure once and for all we're looking at returns this is all about getting good returns it's not about pushing social certain ideological ideologies or social outcomes it's just about fiduciary uh, financial returns uh, I, i'm happy to answer any questions on this but i think this is a um it is a simple and clear way to address the issue. And, and it is needed because we are getting some indications from some of the pension systems, particularly the county system, that they, they do want to pursue some ESG investments. Okay, I think we have a question. Representative Tom Modell Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, do we have any examples in the past where it's been bad? Yes, uh, the fossil fuel industry is a great example where it's been bad. Uh, there have been many of these companies. BlackRock is one of the most prominent ones that's been uh, making very strong statements that their their goal is to push out the coal industry, actually eliminate the coal industry. So uh, that's why the bill was passed last year to give Kentucky some some authority and power to be able to push back against companies that have said they want to eliminate the fossil fuel industry. But it's not limited to just that. We are, are getting wind that it probably, it could be anything. And that's part of the problem with this is that it's it's people who have positions of power um, who have certain outcomes that they want to see in society. So that's the first step that we know of very clearly. And then we're getting wind that it could, it could go anywhere anybody wants to, uh, which is a little scary. I well, I appreciate your effort on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Representative Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I ask a question? Sure. Um, so, Treasurer Ball, in your response to the previous question, your, your response was about a social position. Uh, it had absolutely nothing to do with pecuniary outcomes. So the company BlackRock that you named, do they have good returns on investment aside from their social position? So to clarify, what I was addressing was we don't want social outcomes. We want good returns. So, so what you've just asked me indicates that we want good returns, which is exactly what I'm here for. I want good returns. BlackRock has a mix. Their ESG funds do not perform as well as their non-ESG funds right now. Uh, in the energy investments do outperform a lot of the other ones right now, particularly the tech ones. Tech ones are very high rated on ESG uh, ratings. And, and part of the problem with this is that there's no clarity of what ESG even re really means at this point in time. It could be anything anybody wants. My, and I, I think actually the way you phrase the question, you would agree with this, what we want are strong returns. That should be our primary goal, our only goal. And that's what this would clarify. We're not trying to do anything else but get good returns. So may I ask a follow-up, Chair? Yes, ma'am. So is there definitive proof that if compared to the current ESGs as loosely defined, um, that a spider or some other investment strategy would be a better return? Uh, there, there's definitive proof that ESG, it costs more and right now is giving less returns. So that's that is out there. Uh, will you produce that for us? Uh, we have some, I believe, with us today. Uh, Brittany, you've got some documentation. Uh, so if you're looking for a specific example, we have here BlackRock declared in in the mid-2020 that it would divest from coal for ESG reasons. Since July 2020, the price of coal has increased from under $50 per ton to close to $400 per ton at an almost 800% return. So any investment company that said we are going to divest from coal has missed out on that 800% return. So you've referenced one company uh, that doesn't- BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the entire world. Okay. And that's the only asset manager in the entire world? No, the others that have done this have the same kind of returns. It's, it's well documented. Uh, we can provide more documentation if you want, but it is well documented. It's in many newspaper articles, financial articles. Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, not a digest from a newspaper article, but we would like some hard facts for the committee, please. We'd be happy to provide more documentation. Thank you. 
Representative Grossbart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, may I be listed on the roll call? Certainly. Thank you. And may I ask the question, a question or two? Sure. One at a time. All right. Why is this bill before this committee and not state government like all other pension bills? That I don't know. I'm not the one who assigns it, so uh, I can't answer that question. I would assume part of it has to do with the E aspect of this. Uh, that would just be my guess because uh, we know that uh, that's probably the most prominent use of ESG investing at this point in time. It probably will, and we're seeing signs that it will go to other areas, but uh, the most prominent use of ESG investing has been targeting the fossil fuel industry. Let me, I can answer that. Probably it's before this committee because I requested it. And uh, the reason that I requested this bill is when I came to the legislature in uh, 1995, 93% uh, of electricity from Kentucky uh, came from coal. Now it's probably 70% or less. Since that time, uh, we at the time that I came in, we Kentucky was probably the second lowest electricity rates in the nation. Now we're lucky to stay in the top 10. So a lot has happened in that length of time, and some of us believe that part of the reason <coughs> Is, is that we have not been able allowed to use the uh, energy choices that we have, the resources that are available to us, uh, the resources that work for Kentuckians to not only keep their electricity rates low, but also to provide uh, jobs. Because uh, in industry, uh, at an another thing I will tell you is that when I first came in, um, we Kentucky had an energy intensity rate of about 49%. Now what that means is is that uh, about 49% of our electricity in this state went to large industrial customers. Now those are the people that create jobs and, and they, they invest in the state and um, you know that's a very good thing for us. At that same time for the average state the energy intensive rate was about 20 to maybe 27%. So it was almost uh, twice as much in Kentucky and those were good paying jobs that kept people employed in this state and so when when I see um, decisions that are being made nationally that go against um, what we as Kentuckians feel is in our best interest then we're going this committee is going to look at that just, just like we brought in uh, the, the utility uh, suppliers uh, earlier this month uh, because we experienced something we'd never experienced in this state before, and that was brownouts. And uh, that those are the type of things that we want to make sure uh, may happen once, but they're not the norm, and um, they're not things that will, uh, uh, you know, continue in the future. So go, you're, go ahead. Well, I have a I have a. A uh, committee member who is asked to answer a question, so I certainly will do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I ask a follow-up question of either you or our? Sure. Yes, okay. Um, has the legislature ever weighed in before on where and how a pension system should be invested, and if so, when and where? We have. Do you, yeah, I think an excellent example is last year, Senate Bill 205, which passed and was signed into law by the governor. And it said that if you were a, uh, a company that boycotted the fossil fuel industry, <coughs> then you were not going to be included in our pensions. You're not going to be included in our, in our investment portfolios. So uh, fairly recently, it passed Senate, House, and signed by the governor into law. One follow-up. Thank you. Um, the gentleman, uh, Representative Sharp, at the beginning of your presentation, you said that um, directing um, investments based on social priorities is socialism. So wouldn't propping up the coal industry by directing our investing to support the coal industry be socialism? This is about free markets. And what's going on with ESG is not free markets. It's actually taking control of markets and directing them. So what we're trying to do here is try and ensure we have free markets. Okay. We have a motion on the bill uh, in a second. Ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Representative Bauman? Yes. Representative Blanton? Aye. Representative Bowling? Yes. Representative Bridges? Yes. Representative Burke? Nay. Representative Chester Burton? No. Representative Dossett? Yes. Representative Dotson? Big yes. Representative Flannery? Yes. Representative Fugate, 
Representative Gentry? No. Representative Grossberg? Nay. Representative Johnson? Yes. Representative McCool? Yes. Representative Miles? Yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Wesley? Absolutely. Representative White? Yes. Representative Williams? Yes. And Chair Gooch? Yes. The bill passes with favorable expression that some should pass. So congratulations, Representative. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Treasurer. And thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Thank you, Committee. Okay. Next, we're going to take up House Joint Resolution 37. Uh, Jerry Bowman. <laughs> Please introduce yourself for the record and, and any guests that you have. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Gooch. Um, Treasurer Ball is certainly a tough act to follow. But uh, my name is Representative Jared Ballman. I represent the 28th House District. And I'm State Representative Thomas Hupp. represent the 49th District. Today we have before us uh, House Joint Resolution 37. Uh, the, this resolution um, is asking the Energy and Environment Cabinet to remove the reformulated gasoline requirements that are currently imposed on residents that choose to live in Jefferson, parts of Oldham, and parts of Bullock County. Motion on the bill. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, let me let him, because I think we have one person that asked to speak, Tom Fitzgerald. I think you... Uh, so uh, if you'll come to the table, take the other seat. Are you by yourself or you have? My boss is here, but she's not going to be joining me. <laughs> OK. You're Thank welcome. You be here. Thank you. Tom, you go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, Tom Fitzgerald, uh, formerly director of the Kentucky Resources Council. Uh, with me is Ashley Wilms, who is the director of the council. Uh, I, as I mentioned during the last meeting, I didn't expect to be back, but it is a privilege always to be here in front of the committee. Um, Representative Bauman and I had a, a very brief chance to talk yesterday, and I appreciate him uh, getting back to me. Um, I don't know that anybody at this point is going to say that using reformulated gas is any longer a strategy for uh, ozone control in Jefferson County that is cost effective. And we've gotten that way because of a number of things that have happened over the years. Jefferson County, uh, as many of you know, is the one county in the Commonwealth that manages its own air pollution control district. Every other county could do that if they chose to do so, but no one else has elected to do so. You've provided that local control uh, option for counties. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned to, to the, the sponsor, uh, there are some technical problems with the resolution uh, that need to be uh, fixed at some point in the process. And, and I appreciate the, the committee hearing the bill in the interest of time. I think getting the bill through the, you know, started in the process is, is a good thing. Um, but a couple of years ago, this committee uh, considered House Joint Resolution 8. And that was a resolution that began the process of Jefferson County, which controls the state implementation plan, the plan that they have to supply to the uh, EPA that talks about how to improve air quality and how to reach healthful air quality in terms of ozone and particulates and other pollutants. Um, that process is in motion now. And the, uh, the state and the district, as they were directed by you two years ago, have studied the issue. They are prepared to move forward to change the state implementation plan in order, as I understand it, to eliminate reformulated gas. The, uh, the holdup, and Representative Blant will appreciate this because of our conversation earlier, is that EPA has not yet approved the uh, change to the state implementation plan. And so until they do so, and it's expected this year, uh, the state, you know, the cabinet and air pollution district have done everything they need to do. We believe the numbers show that Louisville, for a number of reasons, including industrial reductions that they have, have taken over the years, 
um, have now achieved that minimum standard of air quality uh, that was set by EPA some years ago. Uh, it's not been an easy process. It's taken a lot of sacrifice on everybody's parts, but we have gotten to that point. If uh, this bill goes forward as written now, it could put that in jeopardy, and that's certainly not the sponsor's intent. Um, I've sent some language that would um, would address the issue and, and hopefully we'll have that conversation going forward. So I'm not here to oppose the resolution, but I am here to mention that there are some technical issues that need to be addressed. I'm happy to talk about those issues, but because of what you all did two years ago, the, the ball is already rolling. The, the process is already in motion to eliminate reformulated gas as a pollution control strategy uh, because uh, it is probably not anywhere near the most cost-effective strategy any longer because of changes in gasoline that have been ordered generally uh, because of other changes that have occurred in terms of emissions of the ozone precursors, volatile organic chemicals, nitrogen oxides that were causing pollution problems in Louisville. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Appreciate this opportunity to explain um, where we are in the bill. Thank you, Tom. Uh, one question that I have is you, you mentioned that this is really widely recognized that, that the reformulated gas is not uh, a good affordable strategy for reducing uh, some of the issues related to the, to, uh, the atmosphere and, and specifically certain areas that may have been in non-containment non or whatever. Uh, do you believe, though, that uh, uh, because Jefferson County has their own board that oversees this, uh, if we eliminate this, will they, uh, that group, in turn, maybe shift um, to other industries that might make them pay a little extra instead of when they're going to the gas pump? Mr. Chairman, that is precisely the concern. I, I participated in development of the strategy for Jefferson County. And part of the problem is section one of the bill here directs the cabinet to make changes that they don't have control over because it is Jefferson County that makes that decision. They have already studied and have said RFG at one point in time was a cost effective strategy but it no longer is relative to some of the other strategies that are out there. And, the, and because of changes that have occurred, it may no longer be necessary to find another mobile source strategy. You know, when you have, you're looking at a, at a, at a, a pie of reductions. Some of them come from major sources, major in industries. Some come from minor area sources, stationary sources, uh, and some come from motor vehicles. Your concern is precisely why years ago, I took a very unpopular stand of trying to keep the vehicle testing program in place. Because when that program was shut down, it was a stationary source, a major employer for Jefferson County who ended up taking an additional reduction in order to offset the loss of those emission controls. So you're absolutely right. You have a budget and that budget is actually federally approved and you can't just pull a piece of those pollution control strategies out of that budget without running into trouble because if unless you have improved the air quality sufficiently somebody else picks up the tab and somebody else usually is major in industrial employers and they are they have done and they're doing their part and so uh, that's a concern uh, so it, it, but you know none of these reductions come for free I understand thank you Tom thank you uh, Representative Gentry thank you Mr. Chair and Thank you, Tom, for that long explanation. Sorry about that. No, Nothing no, no, I ever no, do no, is no. a short I'm very, I'm very new to the committee, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's good information. And I, I have a question to you, Tom, if you would. Um, we in Louisville are well aware of how high our gas is <laughs> compared to everybody else around the state. Mm -hmm. um, most some of us are very aware of our air pollution control challenges over the past several decades and my question to you you, you very clearly stated that um, uh, this is this is no longer a very cost-effective pollution control method so my question is just from a curiosity standpoint when we when we go back is there data that suggests that 
even though it was costly, was it effective in meeting what our what what our objectives were originally? Yes. Uh, in fact, I think that data was presented to the committee uh, last year. There is a, there is a study that was actually commissioned by this General Assembly in 2020 that required the cabinet to go back with the district and look at those numbers. And what you saw is a diminishing returns. There was at a point of time, um, uh, it was a very cost effective strategy and it also allowed us additional time to meet our targets because when you're non-attainment, everybody pays. You have reductions that you're mandated to achieve. And it's a good, you know, the purpose is a laudable purpose. We're trying to make the air quality healthy for people with asthma, people who have compromised immune systems, respiratory systems, cardio, you know, cardiac systems. Um, so it's, it's an important health goal. But you want to pick the best strategy, the one that is the most cost effective, that gets you the biggest bang for the buck. Because somebody does, whether it's consumers at the pump, um, and, and your point's well taken. There was somebody, I believe his chairman, who came to the committee and said, you can't really look at the prices of gas in Jefferson County and say it's one thing that causes it. Because within Jefferson County, the prices vary wildly. Right? Um, we have, you know, here in Frankfurt, at one of the exits, the gas is about 30 cents cheaper than anywhere else I've seen because you have Kroger competing with it. With a with a you know another gas station, uh, in Jefferson County, within 10 minutes of where I live, there's about a 30 percent 30 cent swing uh, between you know uh, one uh, chain that does uh, uh, Costco. I'll just go ahead and say, and some other folks there, and so a lot of factors play into it. But RFG does add an additional cost, and the district and the cabinet looked at the fact that it was an effective strategy, and they've got that data, they've got the study. Uh, because you you all mandated that they update that a couple of years ago. They've done it. They're poised and ready to make the changes. It's just a matter of the process that has to be gone through so that we don't run afoul of our obligations under the Clean Air Act. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and Tom, let me, let me say that where, where you and I may differ a little uh, is that, you know, at, the, at one time we had probably 29 or almost 30 of these what we call boutique fuels. Uh, and, and, and one of the problems was that, you know, you had a different fuel for Jefferson County, a different for Chicago, something different for, in L.A. And, and what would happen is that generally refineries would shut down and then for a short period of time just run that particular blend. And, and we, we saw where, uh, you know, the blend that worked in, LA doesn't work in Chicago or, or New York or Miami or whatever. And uh, um, I, I think that when you disrupt the, uh, the refineries' abilities to run whatever is needed in the country at the same time, other people's prices may go up. And the study that you mentioned probably just specifically looked at, obviously, Jefferson County and what was done there. And, and I think we did uh, get some of the results that, that probably was intended, but I, I, I'm not sure that we're not uh, overlooking what others may have paid uh, because of the refining capacity uh, when you shut down to make those particular types of boutique fuel. So, oh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know that we disagree at all. Even within Jefferson County, there were two strategies for trying to reformulate the gas to make it less volatile. One of them had ethanol added, the other had MTBE, which turned out to be a groundwater pollution issue. So we, in order to clean the air, we've kind of shifted the burden a little bit. Um, and, but you're absolutely right. It, there was in, it crossed the river from Louisville in the same air district or air, air shed. You had lower reed vapor pressure gas being used rather than reformulated gas. So uh, there are certainly are ramifications when you are uh, uh, are trying to uh, control, you're not uniformly controlling the volatility of gas during the summer months. Um, and I think that's a, that's a point well taken. I wouldn't dispute that. Okay. Thank you. Um, don't we have a motion on the bill? Re Representative White, do you want to say something? Yes, sir. Uh, Tom, you said the, uh, you know, Louisville has their own quality, air quality uh, control environmental control uh, guidelines. Does that trump the state's uh, uh, 
is there a reason that uh, the counties can have a, their own control in the state? Uh, is it? Uh, Representative White, it's a good question. Um, for the most part, Jefferson County's regulations follow the state regulations because both are mandated to follow the Clean Air Act. There may be some local circumstances in which those regulations do depart, that do differ. Uh, they go through a notice and comment process. They are subject to judicial review. They're subject to the, the, the Air Pollution District, which is a multi-member district that looks specifically at improving air quality. I think the reason, if you go back to the history of the Air Pollution Districts, it was recognized that certain communities have more difficult challenges for air quality than other counties might uh, because of the location, because of the amount of industry, because it's in a river valley, um, because we are, you tend to see um, more significant problems with, it used to be called the Smoke Commission, that's how far back it goes. Uh, and and the, I think the General Assembly has over the years uh, recognize that certain issues are better handled locally, but they are required to meet the same minimum standards. The permitting process is the same. Both are, are subject to the Clean Air Act. You know, we've decided in Kentucky that we want to run those programs, and as such, we have certain obligations to to mirror what's in the federal law. Uh, but they they are able to uh, to go beyond the state minimum. Um, the, they don't do so very often. And in my experience over the past 43 years, they do so only when they believe, for example, we, Jefferson County has adopted an air toxics reduction program, which is a national model that um, has brought down the air toxics uh, in Louisville to the point where it is no longer life-threatening to live on the other side of a fence from some of the industrial facilities because it used to be the the level of of cancer risk was substantially greater than what we considered de minimis uh, just really? by virtue of what neighborhoods people lived in so jefferson county has gone beyond where it is it, you know where it's deemed necessary um and there are you know there are um uh there are guide you know there are uh, lanes that they have to stay in when they do that. They have to justify it. They have to, they're subject to judicial review if they uh, go beyond what the law or what the science would allow. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, you know, Jefferson County, and you have just across the river, you have a lot of industries there. In, in, uh, does that, do they have any uh, quality control over there? Or, they, or do they work together? They do. That's a very good question. Um, when you look at the air quality regions that are identified by EPA, the region for Louisville includes, and that's why it's in the bill here, a little bit of Bullock County, a little bit of Oldham County, and it includes a couple of counties in southern Indiana. And so those southern Indiana counties are managed by IDEM, uh, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, and they do work together uh, with Louisville to try to achieve those reductions that are necessary you know we have the same thing in northern kentucky a lot of our air quality regions that have had air quality problems are multi-state regions you know northern kentucky you've got boone kent campbell and then you've got cincinnati and hamilton county so um that's a good question but they do uh, as as i understand they do work together um uh, to try to to achieve air quality because they do they share the same air shed yeah yeah well, thank you, Representative White. Uh, well, thank you. We, we do have a motion and a second reveal, but I'm going to allow one question by Representative Grossberg. Then I'm going to allow uh, Representative Bowman and uh, uh, Huff if you have anything else that you want to add before we take a vote. Representative Grossberg. Uh, I'd actually like to make a statement, Mr. Chairman, if that's sure. okay. Um, I am an asthmatic. I developed environmental asthma by living in the Ohio River Valley. I am a lifelong environmentalist and it runs in the family because my grandfather, who is a chemist in World War II and then for the US Department of Agriculture and was part of the team that banned DDT, was one of the founding scientists of the EPA. So this is an issue that matters to me personally, but as an asthmatic and an environmentalist, I also believe in good policy because bad policy undermines good policy and I think that these changes are long overdue. 
Uh, I wish that we could bring back the vehicle emissions testing, but that's not on the table today. What is on the table to me is a no brainer because uh, any time that we're spending dollars to save pennies, and in this case, environmentally, metaphorically speaking, spending dollars to save p pennies, we're not putting our resources elsewhere. So as an asthmatic and an environmentalist, I am still voting yes. Thank, Thank you, Representative. Gentlemen, do you have anything else you want to add? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Representative Huff. Okay, Clerk, call the roll, please. Representative Bauman. Yes. Representative Blanton. Aye. Representative Bowling. Yes. Representative Bridges. Yes. Representative Burke. Yes. Representative Chester Burton. Yes. Representative Dawson. Yes. Representative Dotson. Yes. Representative Flannery. Aye. Representative Fugate. Representative Gentry. Explain my vote, please. I'm going to be a yes today, but uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned about what Mr. Fitzgerald said about uh, language, and, and um, I would, would hope that we can, can look at that and try to get that fixed, and, and uh, I'm more than happy to make this go away. <laughs> Thank you. Representative Grossberg. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative McCool. Yes. Representative Miles? Yes. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Wesley? Yes. Representative White? Yes. Representative Williams? Aye. And Chair Gooch? Yes. Passes. Okay, bill, the bill passes. So, committee, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we, uh, as you know, our time slot is normally 8 to 10, but I will always try to uh, uh, schedule meetings where we can start at 9 and still get our business done and leave the next group that's going to take this meeting uh, time to get set up. And we've done that, and I thank the committee members for that. So this meeting is adjourned.